begin today um, sessions that will deal with projects that are currently conducted by European Law Institute. And I think it is a wonderful structure given to the conference that the, first, the very first panel that we are going to have today is on uh, climate justice, new challenges for law and judges. I think it perfectly inscribes in what we have heard so far. We had extremely interesting, a very thought-provoking uh, presentation by uh, Christiane Ram Ramberg, and she was talking about the role of judges, uh, <coughs> judge-made law. And then yesterday, we had somehow daunting uh, presentation about climate changes. And now we are talking <laughs> in merits about those two subjects. Where are judges in t at times of uh, horrible, horrible climate changes? Uh, we are, as usual, short with time, uh, so I don't want to um, go on with introductory remarks. Uh, and I would like to pass the mic to the uh, co-reporter, Hendrik Andersen, uh, who is an Associate Professor of International Economic Law at Copenhagen Business School. Uh, he co-founded the Nordic Center for Climate Law and Economics. Uh, he, his research uh, concentrates particular on the relationship between the law and policies of the World Trade Organization, international climate change law, and the rule of law. And just uh, uh, to let you know, he is a co-reporter. The other reporter, unfortunately, uh, could not have uh, joined us due to uh, uh, health reasons, uh, but uh, we all hope that Alberto Di Franceschi uh, will be back on his feet in no time and uh, we'll be able to see him. Uh, for housekeeping rules, I will be extremely strict with time. I'm sorry, <laughs> sorry. Uh, so uh, please, Henrik, begin and keep to the time schedule. Thank you. Right. Thank you very much. And um, first of all, let me apologize for not being with you. I understand you've had some um, very interesting uh, sessions uh, yesterday. Um, uh, unfortunately, my teaching has been on for, for two weeks now, and I have to teach right, uh, right after uh, this. And that's why I cannot be with you in, in, <clears throat> in Madrid. So, but what I will do first uh, is to share my, my screen. Uh, with you and please let me know because the only thing I can see now is my own screen. Can you see my slides? Y yes, yes. <clears throat> y you can try to hit the presentation mode. Uh, yes, we had some challenges with that before, but you can see if I'm yes, change, yes. change them here. You can see them. Yes. Um, right. Oh. That was a bit fast. We'll go back to. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's amazing. It's like the uh, variation of what we had yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> we are waiting for well, the sound I, effect so okay. I can. I think we managed we managed to get there now. <laughs> okay, sorry about it. Um, I'm I'm going to do two things now. Um, I'm going to give a short <clears throat> um, presentation of of the project, and then I will address one of the various issues that we deal with uh, in the project. But the project it, it's called Principles on Climate Justice: New Challenges for Law and uh, and Judges. Um, and this project it, it started due to some of the challenges that we see in climate litigation. And in particular, two things that we look at, we look at liability for corporations and we look at liability for states. Now, what is the legal basis for establishing liability for states and corporations? And that's both liability for lawful actions and liability based on uh, wrongful conduct. Um, the thing is, the judges, they have a very important role uh, at the moment because legislation, it's not 
really that clear when it comes to, to climate change. It's, it's a relatively new thing. Um, and we see that work is done both on international and European and national level in order to fill in all those gaps that seems or regulatory gaps that are uh, at the moment. So what we see the courts, what they do when they want to um, on one hand say that uh, it's a violation of the law, they will look at international law, they will look at human rights and they will look at civil law. Um, and the question is, can we get from there also to questions about uh, liability for uh, states and, and corporations if they violate uh, international law, human rights and, and civil law. Now, our um, the aim of, of these principles, that is to provide the courts with an overview of different legal and soft legal instruments that can apply directly or indirectly in climate change cases. And that means that when, when I say an overview, we are looking at different sectors of law and see how, how are they interrelated with, uh, with each other. And we provide courts with legal methodologies to determine liability in climate cases of both inter internal and transboundary nature. And also by doing that, we point out the regulatory holes that we see in the system and provide legisl legislators with guidance for tackling the climate change related uh, issues. Mm. So, but in particular, that thing, the cross sectorial discussion of the law, which is very interesting. Um, how are human rights, for example, how are they related to questions about uh, climate change? And how are they related to questions in civil law? Can human rights serve as an overall context for the interpretation of, uh, of civil law? One big question is, do we see the, this um, law, climate law, do we see it as a whole or do we have a fragmented picture? Now, we are going to see again if we can connect some of these gaps there are by providing these um, uh, legal context that can be used for interpretation of the relevant sector that is applied in a particular uh, case. But at the same time, we must also see what are the limits uh, of the law. We are not here to say that, that courts, they have to take a legislative function. We have to act or suggest these principles within the, the rule of law. And I should say to do that, we have a very strong uh, project team and a very strong advisory board, and they are highly engaged uh, in, in this project and providing so much in inspiration, so much spaces for, for discussion. And that's why I enjoy this project uh, so, so much. The principles that we will suggest, that will more be to give like an upper and lower limit of the law then it must be up to the respective national courts to, uh, to decide whether, first of all, they can apply any of these principles and also if they want to take a narrow approach to them or a wide approach uh, to them, hence what I call the upper and lower limit uh, of the law. Moving on to, to one of the questions that we, that we deal with, um, corporate liability for breach of international law, question mark. Now, that raises a number of questions. First of all, um, a question about applicability of international law in national systems. Um, that is very much left to the national systems, whether they um, accept international law um, that it can apply. I mean, standing alone <clears throat> as a legal instrument in a case. The next question, that is, if we assume in those jurisdictions where it can apply, the next question is the effect of it. Can an international rule principle of law impose an obligation on a corporation? Now, that is where we'll have to look at the specific wording of the rule or an understanding of the particular principle. Is it sufficiently clear to impose obligations on a corporation? And if that's not the case, the question is, can they serve as an interpretative context for the court where they will apply national law instead? Now, we have uh, various instruments where we see um, international law uh, refer to corporate liability, at least in an indirect way. We have it 
uh, various treaties where the treaties they provide liability that there should be for corporations. However, that that does not imply that these treaties are binding on corporations. They must necessarily go through the national system in the first place. The states, they must comply with their treaty commitments and in good faith. And that is either they implement it through the legislative mechanism or if it is a system where international law apply directly, it's an integral part of, of national law. Another question that is international soft law, can they also to some extent have an obligatory character? And there is a question, how do we make a line between soft law and hard law? Can we make that line particularly clear? And for example, corporate social responsibility for corporations, can they in any way make a or appear to be a binding commitment for corporations, uh, in particular when they link it to international uh, law. And then I give an example here, UN guiding principles on, on business and human rights. It's a soft law instrument, various, a lot of corporations, they refer to, to them, but the question is, can that be applied, if not directly, then indirectly as interpretative context for the courts in, in these cases where they have to establish a liability for corporations. And then um, I would say, um, giving an example of uh, another issue, the territorial dimension there is to, when talk about corporate liability and international law, there's this case from, from Canada where a can Canadian company had some operations in, uh, in another country and in that country, uh, they made a case against the corporation for violation of international human rights. And the Supreme Court uh, in Canada accepted that. Now, something is happening in another territory, but the Supreme Court accepted that international law could apply to that Canadian company was bound by it because international law was an integral part of uh, Canadian law. And it could also serve potentially as basis for uh, liability claims. And that's a very interesting case in particular because we talk about operations that take place outside of Canadian uh, territory. And finally, time is really running here. Questions that we have to, to ask here. Um, how, how do we, um, in particular, when we look at the climate litigation, the causation issue, that is a, a, big, a big deal. We cannot just assume if we say that corporations are bound by human rights, if they are so, we must also distinguish between the different kinds of human rights violations then. If, and it's also a big if, because we haven't established that, at, at least from the European Court of Human Rights yet, the convention, is that applicable to situations with climate change? We don't know that yet. We'll get some uh, judgment um, uh, quite soon. We'll get some answers to it. But even so, when we look at climate issues, now we have a corporation in one country with CO2 emission in that country. Does that imply that one can make a human rights claim in another country against these potential human rights violations taking place in, in the first country <clears throat> or what? These are questions that the courts, they need to, uh, to address. Thank you. My time has uh, run out. Um, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Henrik. <clears throat> Actually, you, you still had 30 seconds, but uh, thank you. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> thank you. Uh, and uh, thank you very much. <laughs> and our next uh, speaker in the panel uh, is judge and doctor uh, Matthias Keller, who is a presiding judge at the Administrative Court of Aachen. Uh, he is a co-chairman of the Environmental Law Working Group within the Association of European Administrative Judges and a member of the EU Expert Group of Academics on Access to Justice in Environmental Matters. Uh, his talk is going to be about the role of the judge, which is very appropriate, uh, to hear from the within. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank Ten you. minutes. So thank you, Aneta. It's very nice to be here. I'm honored to be here. And we had uh, 
some technical problems now, but not with me, I think. Everybody can uh, hear me uh, clear and loud. And um, normally, I'm doing legal education, continuing education for judges. And it's my task to keep them awake, because normally those sessions are uh, done in the afternoon. Now it's my task here to wake you up. And um, that's what we are doing. It will be a little, I will go very uh, fast, like on German Autobahn. Huh? <laughs> and here we are, the uh, climate justice, from my perspective as a practitioner, sometimes looks like an impossible triangle. Look at that triangle. That's confusing. <coughs> huh? You have two different per perspectives, and it's not clear what is it. I mean, it's not possible. So I'll leave you with this um, impression of climate justice as I conceive it. And here is another practitioner. And Liz Fisher from Oxford University, Chair of Environmental Law, and she puts it together, polycentric nature of climate change, multivalent, uncertain, uncertainty. Huh? That's something we don't like as, as lawyers, uncertainty. Social political conflicts, which uh, climate change engender all and make it legally disruptive. So what role for the judges? My, I didn't prepare well, obviously. My simple answer is nothing else than what we have always, since King Solomon, been expecting from judges. Let them come to the courtroom, broad exits. Very, very important in uh, environmental law, especially in Germany and Austria. We struggle with that. Hearing both sides, and for the academia, I say, oh, ja, to it altera pass. Understanding the problem, awareness, specialization, and a solid, Solomonic, if you want, fact-finding. Huh? The, 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 the story of Solomon was fact-finding. Huh? We very often forget this. So applying the existing legislating in a creative way to new climate change problems, and therefore, that's my take on the matter, stabilizing legal uh, disruption and creating perhaps a new legal certainty. So that was, um, uh, Henrik was saying that, um, climate change necessitates judge-made law, even in the continental system. So, well, objection, Your mm -hmm. Honor, you are not the legislator. So my answer would be objection overruled, even in the French system. The icon, Georges Videl, said, why, why do we want to replace the wonderful judge by the <coughs> legislator? C'est amateur, c'est amateur, bien intentionné, mais parfois maladroit. So come to the judges. And they have a certain a room of discretion, which we call interpretation. And that's very much rooted in European legal culture. Go to the Tribunal Supremo in Madrid, and you will find Papignano. And this old um, jurist, Roman jurist, said, well, it's, I will translate it for the judges, to assist, to supplement, to correct the law. And therefore, 
I have the conclusion um, with um, uh, Lord Robert Conworth. Uh, he's very uh, known among uh, the Environmental Law so Society. He served as a Supreme Court judge, which was the former House of Lords um, in the UK. And, well, <laughs> I would like to quote him that courts are uniquely placed to create the stable and legally enforceable structures necessary to ensure proper planning and supervision and enforcement. Ah, oh, here's the point. The courts cannot dictate policy. Let's leave something to the legislator. Huh? That is for the government. But the courts can ensure that the policy is rational and coherent and consistent with the scientific evidence and that firm policy commitments are honored. So where, it, and this is, oh, this is so much to do, there's so much on our docket, then, then let's leave something, let's leave something to, to, to the government and one of the <coughs> lawyers in the famous Urgenda uh, case told me in Ferrara in the preparation conference which is um, an important point as well, which I think that's right. Let's leave something to the church huh? <laughs> as well. So we, it's, at the moment, we are in a, a discussion uh, where the question arises, will the courts save the world? No, I'm sorry. I will not save the world. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'm, 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 I know that I uh, concentrate too much on how timely the presentations are, but thank you so much. <laughs> You're and welcome. And mean it ahead. So we are going to have plenty of time for us. I saved uh, some time, not the world. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but uh, it's enough for, 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 for right now. Uh, and our last speaker in the session uh, is uh, Angel Manuel Moreno Molina, uh, who is a full professor uh, of law at the uh, Université Carlos III in Madrid, yeah. here. <laughs> uh, he's a member of the Aboceta Network of European Environmental Lawyers and a substitute member of the Board of Appeal of the EU Chemicals Agency. Uh, and uh, he will give us a skeptical view uh, of on climate litigation. That's right. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'm very honored and thankful to the organizers for inviting me to this session. Yes, a skeptical view on climate litigation. Uh, I wanted to provide uh, probably not an enthusiastic vision of climate litigation and uh, highlight the limitations, the obstacles, uh, the peculiar features of climate litigation and sometimes the shortcomings of the litigation. Climate litigation is an incredibly uh, developed uh, legal phenomenon according to a well-known database of Columbia University. There are more than 2,000 cases around the world dealing with climate litigation. But the first murky question is the concept itself. I find that the concept is too broad. And if you read the different cases, you see cases dealing with the challenge of a permit for manufacturing uh, an industry that will manufacture cheese or uh, an NGO challenging a project to enlarge an airport. Uh, since climate is so uh, broad and so uh, horizontal, we, we, we risk to have a too broad understanding of climate li litigation. Um, basically, there are two types of litigations here, uh, public law litigation and private law litigation. I will only address the first one. 
Concerning the public law litigation, uh, we can uh, identify two basic scenarios. Uh, cases where mainly NGOs challenge the national policy on climate change that has been approved by the competent national authorities or the European Union, as it has been the case, or cases where NGOs or individuals challenge permits or uh, different uh, administrative decisions allocating for the development of projects. This litigation usually takes place in administrative courts. Uh, a very good, uh, very weird exception is the Urgenda case. The Urgenda case, as you know, was adjudicated by a, by a commercial court. That is absolutely incredible by a Spanish perspective because no commercial court in Spain has jurisdiction or authority to adjudicate such a claim. It is an, uh, the exclusive competence of administrative courts. Um, one of the, the first problems I see that this public law litigation entails deep constitutional and political science questions. Climate law, this type of climate law litigation of which I'm talking about is not just regular administrative litigation. Uh, administrative courts were invented in the 19th century to deal with, uh, with challenges where an individual challenges a governmental decision approving an expropriation or a sanction, but the administrative jurisdiction is not conceived or prepared to adjudicate or take broad decisions on overarching horizontal climate and economic policies of, of the land. We could ask the question whether well, courts are the appropriate forum to adjudicate these cases. Are these, these climate uh, cases, are they about questions of law or are they questions of policy? Um, if we understand that they are questions of policy or that questions of policy mainly involve, as uh, Judge Keller mentioned, then there is a danger that uh, I would not say, I would not use the word fraud, but we risk to uh, have a constitutional fast track by which key national decisions are taken in a forum that it has not been designed to do those, those decisions. So political policy issues should be uh, adjudicated and decided by the political process and by political actors. I will provide an example. In Spain, now there is a pending case in the Supreme Court, is Greenpeace v. Spain, or the, the central government. Greenpeace is suing the central government because according to this NGO, the National Integrated Policy uh, on Climate and Energy, approved by the central government as required by the regulation on the governance, uh, is not ambitious enough. So the NGO claims that more reductions should be uh, accomplished by Spain. Well, this plan was drafted by experts, hundreds of experts of different ministries, of different uh, governmental agencies working for months, making economic projections, statistics. Then there were uh, comprehensive stakeholder participation, public participation. There was a comprehensive strategic environmental uh, mm, assessment performed. And then three years later, the government approved this plan. Then we have this suit, uh, this, uh, this claim, this lawsuit in the, in, the, in the Supreme Court. Well, if the Supreme Court takes uh, this case and, and, and sides with the claimant, with the plaintiff, then the uh, Supreme Court may be tempted to say, no, the reduction of 30%, I don't remember the exact figures, is not enough because Spain should reduce 40%. Well, we have obtained in a, in a judicial forum which should be decided by political actors through the political process with participation, with public involvement, with citizenship uh, participation, with strategic environment. This decision of the court will be taken without all these requirements. So it's, I think this is a fast track. Maybe some political parties may be tempted to think that they can obtain in courts where they didn't obtain in the polls, in the elections. Huh? Well, this is a democracy or political science consideration. Uh, this is, but I think this is very important to, to think about this. This is not regular litigation. It, it involves, in my view, constitutional problems. Second issue is, are courts fit for this review 
Well, I mentioned that the plan, the Spanish plan, is almost 500 pages prepared by experts. There were many consultations, physicians, physics uh, economists, uh, many people uh, deliver uh, opinions and reports. And then we have the judge who is a legal expert, but he's not a technical expert. May even, even scientists do not agree on the extent, on the seriousness of, of climate change and on the solutions to climate change. Yeah? Uh, so how can we understand that the courts can adjudicate these complex, these complex issues? Judge Keller said, uh, we hear both sides. Yes, but we have the government who represent the national sovereignty, who represents the political uh, and democratic process, and then we have an NGO who represents who? We don't know, maybe 10, 100 people. Uh, and they pretend that the policy framed by the political actors is not enough, according to them, but based on which data, according to which expertise. And then we have a final problem. This lawsuit is a lawsuit in which the courts may exercise a control of legality. Do not forget this. An administrative court has to decide whether the decision, whether the regulation is legal or illegal. It's not that it's not ambitious, it's not fair enough, it's not fine enough, it would be better. But which are the legal rules? And then we have another obstacle. The legal framework to adjudicate this claim is very murky because there are no clear rules that broad mandates basically enshrined in the Constitution. For instance, the Spanish Constitution says that the public authorities will work for the protection of the environment. That's it. So there are no clear compelling, apart from you, objectives and uh, the, the objectives of penetration of renewables in the directives and so on. But in the Constitution, there is not a clear mandate by which you can decide whether the national plan approved by the government is ambitious enough or not. There is a plan. It has been approved through the due process according to the procedure. It respects the EU law. So what's wrong about it? There is a room for political discretion, and this is respected by the courts. Uh, finally, <laughs> there are many problems, <laughs> but we don't have the time. There are many procedural obstacles that prevent sometimes uh, this climate litigation. For instance, locus standi, like in the Carvalho case or the Peter Sabo case where the court says, well, you're not directly affected, the Plowman text, the test. you cannot come here and require the whole European Union to modify its policy just because you don't like it. Huh? In some countries, the judge cannot modify the content of a regulation, only a no or upheld it. For instance, in Spain, in this previous case, if the Supreme Court takes the case of Greenpeace, what they can do is to annul the plan, but they cannot modify it. The judge has no authority to say, instead of 20, it should be 35. So then we have lost five years of time. We need to redo uh, the whole procedure, which will take five years more, so that would be a loss of time, in my view. And finally, the enforcement of decisions. So even when the court orders the government to do more, it is very difficult for the courts to enforce the government to do more if the government doesn't want to do more because the, the tools at hand of the courts are very limited. For instance, if you go to the Orhenda case, apparently, according to a Dutch colleague, the government, uh, the, the, the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions as required by the courts has been obtained, but not because of the government action, because, but, but because of the pandemic. So we have reduced the emissions, but it was not linked to the decision itself. Uh, and finally, have you heard of any climate litigation in China, the largest contributor to climate change during the last 20 years? I don't know, so maybe you have have heard of one successful case that would be interesting to know. Well, that's all. Thank you very much. I think I have respected the time limit. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, um, uh, thank you very much. Uh, it was extremely interesting, um, uh, yet somehow daunting and uh, not very encouraging. But uh, <laughs> that being said, uh, <laughs> 
yes, we are all going to. Okay, whatever. Uh, I would like to open the um, uh, floor for questions. Yes, uh, please. Uh. <laughs> Thank you very much. This was uh, very interesting. Congratulations to the speakers. Uh, one or two uh, remarks. Uh, first, uh, would it be possible to uh, envisage that uh, the European Union could be sued because uh, we see that uh, corporations are sued, states, but uh, the European Union has also some uh, competence in uh, this case, and that was my, uh, my first uh, question. Uh, second uh, point, I'm very uh, interested by the fact that also companies uh, are sued and what is uh, very characteristic is that companies uh, can be sued for damages which occurs uh, outside, uh, uh, outside their activity. Uh, uh, this what is uh, the international uh, uh, competence of a judge for something which uh, could happen uh, uh, in Africa or something for uh, maybe another company? Just maybe I go too far, but that, that's, uh, that was my second question. Uh, let's let's gather questions first and then um, uh, have a short run of answers, okay? Uh, there was a question here somewhere. Yes, please. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'm Anaïs Berthier from Client Earth. So for those who don't know Client Earth, it's an environmental NGO that is composed of lawyers. Uh, across our eight offices, and we're around almost 1,300 lawyers across the EU and beyond. So you won't be surprised to know that <laughs> I'm a bit surprised by your vision. And uh, first of all, uh, I, I don't know that Greenpeace case, but, but the cases that we bring and that are brought generally by NGOs before the court are based on legal grounds. And so we do bring strategic litigation, which means that we won't bring a case if we don't have legal solid grounds and solid arguments. And I was a bit surprised because the image you gave gave a bit the impression that the, the cases were not based on legal grounds and that we were just, or that Greenpeace was just contesting the plan, uh, not basing itself on, on legal grounds. And so to say that the courts and administrative courts are not uh, the right forum for NGOs which represent civil society and to a certain extent represent the environment cannot challenge the legality of acts taken by national authorities uh, is uh, having uh, uh, no, we don't have the same vision of what the role of the judges and the courts are, because to us it's really to, to say the law. And uh, uh, yeah, so the second point is, for example, even when there is an environment, environmental impact assessment, or even when decisions are based on scientific grounds, uh, it means that you do have legal grounds and scientific grounds to challenge the decision. Either environmental impact assessments are not done correctly, thoroughly, or do not follow the, for example, the environmental impact assessment directive. So that brings us a legal ground. Um, so, so yeah, and, and climate litigation, I think it's true, it's just a general broad term that is used, uh, not necessarily by us. And it's true that it enshrines uh, very different types of litigation uh, but it doesn't mean that it, it's, it's not uh, grounded into solid legal, legal grounds. And I will actually add some of these legal grounds in my presentation later because there are even more. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Okay, maybe we can answer the questions now. And um, yeah, perhaps I start? Yes. Yep. yes sir. Um, yeah. Is uh, the European Union sued? Uh, Anaïs Berthier could perhaps say more about that. Um, but um, there is another mechanism. Um, the European Union uh, is in environmental law is mm, under the pressure of the so-called Aarhus Compliance Committee. 
So we have a piece of international law, environmental law, procedural law, uh, which is called the Aarhus Convention. And there is a, a court-like a court committee um, that uh, puts pressure on the EU to make standing more generous. We heard the famous Plowman test. And that's a little bit the, the, the mechanism to um, make the EU um, respect the procedural requirements. And of course, uh, Client Earth is, is very active in different uh, fields and different um, cases that are very specific. Um, and um, well, uh, the other, I think uh, the, the, the other question, um, whether it could be uh, the right thing to, to um, have a, a liability of corporations under the human rights law. Um, perhaps we, next time we should invite the colleagues from the Canadian Supreme Court and let them explain what they are thinking. And uh, perhaps Elena Kagan would like to go then to Canada, to the <laughs> Canadian Supreme Court. Um, well, um, and uh, perhaps to, to, to Anais, um, um, well, it's, it's, it's um, quite settled that we have uh, public interest uh, litigation on legal grounds uh, at my court, administrative court, and other courts. Um, the problem is not yet solved. Oh, we, we struggle a lot with public interest litigation in Germany. We have it in environmental law, but for individuals, public concern, not only NGOs, but also in, still, still an open question whether an individual uh, could uh, launch public interest. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Concerning the question of the, about the European Union, the European Union has already been sued several times by individuals. Uh, there are now at least two cases, Peter Sabo and others, against the Commission and, uh, and the Parliament, and Carvalho and others uh, against the European institutions. The problem is that the court, uh, first, the court of first instance, or the general court, sorry, and then the, the, the Court of Justice said that you, you, you do not comply with the procedural requirements to introduce an action for annulment because the action that you introduce in the court is an action for annulment. And this is very interesting because, as we know, the action for annulment for the, for the Court of Justice is based on the French model of recours en annulation of the French jurisdiction. So you need to have a qualified link, a personal concern, you it must be affected by the rule, and we know that, except in the, the famous Codor new case, it's very difficult for a firm or an individual to claim in the EU court that the EU rule or a EU policy is illegal, because that's the test. The, the, the test of illegality should be an infringement of international law or an infringement of the treaty, and it has not been uh, said. But also in, in, in national domestic courts, this uh, rationale can be found in the famous case Seniorinen für Klima, uh, the, 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 Swiss, uh, the Swiss ladies who are suing the Swiss government because according to them, uh, the Swiss government is not doing enough to combat climate change, uh, the first instance, and then the federal uh, Verwaltungsgericht uh, Chamber declared that those ladies, uh, we understand your problem, but you are not, you have not demonstrated that you will suffer from heat waves in a more or more specific way than the rest of the population. So you don't have this specific uh, qualification to go to the court. Concerning the corporate uh, liability, there is, in my, uh, there is. Uh, uh, a draft directive for uh, EU corporate diligence, which incorporate also a, 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 a strict scrutiny on how the corporation is applying uh, 
uh, environmental laws. In the future, maybe it could be a, a ground for pursuing companies. Yeah? So far, there have been successful examples like uh, the, the proceedings against uh, Dutch company, the Dutch uh, uh, shell company, uh, which has been condemned by, 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 by Dutch courts. This company has been sued in other countries by other NGOs who are claiming that this company is not doing enough. And the company has been ordered by the Dutch court to reduce by a certain amount its emissions. So it is already here. This is a, an important de de development. In other cases, the link of causation is very difficult to demonstrate, like in the famous Raul Luciano Yuva case, the Peruvian citizen who is living in Peru, but is suing in Germany, Reve, the big German company who has not even assets in Peru. Is, he's claiming that his house is gonna be uh, affected by this, uh, there is a, a, an, a, a, an ice um, who is going to, to uh, to smell and his uh, to melt, sorry, and his house will be f uh, flooded by by this uh, development. But uh, as far as I know, the case has not been adjudicated yet. Uh, but the judges have been in Peru, <laughs> the German oh, judges. Really? Yes. <laughs> just just, just to see to see to take evidence. Yeah. And concerning the, the possibility. Uh, oh, the possibility. Yes, that's that's. <laughs> yeah. We like to see. <laughs> Concerning the, the client earth uh, representative intervention, uh, uh, maybe it was misunderstood. Uh, I'm not against climate litigation. I was highlighting the problems and, and the constitutional questions that are in, uh, in, involved. I know your work. I have analyzed your, your initiatives. I encourage you to, to go forward. What I was saying is that sometimes the legal grounds are very murky, are very loose. If you analyze the Rohanda case, the legal base, I mean, with due respect, <laughs> with the commercial <laughs> court of the Hague, I mean, the duty of the, the duty of care of the civil code of the uh, Napoleon times, is that a, legal, a clear legal rule? I don't see a clear legal rule in that. I see maybe uh, another risk that I haven't mentioned, sorry for, because we have a judge here, of judicial activism. Eh? So too, too, broad, too broad interpretation of, of broad, uh, and I don't think this gives legal certainty. Yeah? Um, of course, if there are cases where climate litigation is involved, where the legal framework is very clear, for instance, EIA litigation, we have European Union directive, national, subnational laws, and here we can build a real claim. But um, if you read many cases, they, are, we, they invoke broad principles which are not really uh, declare as such uh, their principles in nuce, as we say, that they are developing, like the principle of non-regression, which is not clearly established at the international level, general principles of liability, but not clear, uh, clear uh, legal rules. <clears throat> and I think that the courts have to provide legal certainty. Yeah? That's my point. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And now Hendrik. Right. Thank you. Um, yeah, just just a few points about the the EU being being sued. Um, there are different mechanisms for this, of course. It, it's it's not only the the mechanism where an individual will uh, take um, the commission or one of the other EU institutions before the the Court of Justice. But another way to do it is to challenge EU secondary law at the national level uh, under the procedure of Article two hundred sixty seven. Um, where the Court of Justice also has the competence to annul um, uh, EU second, secondary law. Um, but then there's also in the national systems, I mean, there have been, I would assume in most EU countries, there have been cases before the national courts where it might not be the EU directly sued, but questions about um, did the national um, institutions um, did they stay out of line by following the EU because it was a violation of the national constitutions, for example? That have been tried in, you know, in Denmark, we've had a few cases uh, about this where the, the Supreme Court at one point said that um, 
that the prime minister had not stepped beyond the, the constitution. But that is, we can say, at least indirect way to, to challenge uh, uh, the EU. Then, of course, there's the challenges at international level. Um, for example, in the World Trade Organization, uh, although it, the World Trade Organization is about trade, it is, of course, also concerning issues about environment. Um, and there, uh, I think Malaysia um, has initiated a case against the, the EU for the EU's um, uh, the EU actually protection of the climate by prohibiting uh, the import of uh, palm oil. Um, so, but it can go between states um, uh, as well. Um, the second thing I, I want to address that is we come back to the Canadian Supreme Court. What was it they said about the liability? and international law, and they made it quite simple. They said, well, international law is part of our common law. And if a corporation uh, breaches our common law and international law, well, then there's basis for liability. So that's quite, quite simply, uh, simply put, although they said it might not be the tort law mechanism we have to look at here, there might be something else we have to, to look at, but we have these instruments available in the national uh, national systems. Um, so, and, um, and the, the second um, uh, person with, with a question, um, uh, I understand you're going to give a presentation uh, later to, today. I hope all this will be recorded because I, I would love to hear your presentation. I think the NGOs are, extremely important uh, when it comes to the uh, protection of the climate because the climate cannot speak for itself and that's why these NGOs are so so important and I hope everything will be recorded so I can see it later on because unfortunately I will be teaching uh, at, at that time right thank you uh, thank you very much and uh, I would like to raise a much more general question um, we are all lawyers here and judges, which is, uh, you cannot be more of a lawyer than to be a judge. <laughs> uh, but the, uh, the problems that we are discussing here are, they escape the normal considerations because climate change is about um, our survival as a, as human beings. And this is a completely different level of, uh, of a problem or of an issue than anything that we could have uh, been talking about as lawyers ever. I'm not sure if uh, humanity, we people faced ever this problem that we are facing right now. We are not dinosaurs and dinosaurs are not with us anymore for different reasons, we don't know why. And now I'm just wondering whether uh, what we do as lawyers, which is uh, going back to the structures that we know, going back to the, uh, uh, to the traditional view on law, uh, falling back on democratic process, which we've heard a lot about uh, during our first session um, on Orlando lecture. Um, the trust we put in democracy, which is particularly um, strong in Germany, for example, uh, is this the right way? Um, is climate change not the subject that should be changing our perception of what we do for society? Because this is entirely different problem. <coughs> uh, and um, I was, uh, I was listening to you with um, great appreciation when you were talking about um, how carefully was, uh, how, how carefully prepared was the Spanish uh, process of establishing the targets. And I cannot see my country doing it. Uh, my country disregards this uh, issue entirely. And now with the limitations that judges have, um, when, where comes the responsibility towards society? And I know I'm now um, 
escaping the paradigms of normal legal discussion. But maybe this is the subject. I'm, I'm a private lawyer. I would never have spoken anything like this <laughs> when we would talk about uh, sales law or services. But I have three children. And uh, what is the future in the world? So, you know, I, I know I'm provocative. So, uh, yes, please, go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> so if we have such groundbreaking uh, questions, I would say, well, we have professors for this. <laughs> <laughs> and and plenty. I, I'm only, I'm limited to, to cases, uh, like in the American Constitution, to cases and controversies. <laughs> so it's not yet a case, I think. <laughs> but we have to think about it, to contemplate <coughs> it. It's, it's important. And I would like to, to, to uh, refer to Liz Fisher from, from Oxford. And that's why I liked it very much. He said, well, it's groundbreaking, and we've never seen it. But we have to keep our values, to keep our very basic values uh, that we have developed. And that is procedure, good procedure, fair procedure, and um, something we would call in German, German uh, terms, reduction of the discretion. If something is very urgent, the discretion, the discretionary powers, they are limited. And I, I'm um, very much um, skeptical. The, the function, the traditional function um, of uh, the administrative court, where I sit, is not so broad. But when it comes to the to a constitutional level, when we, when we see the climate uh, problem, the climate litigation, climate justice, as a constitutional problem, like human rights, mm -hmm. then we have, at least in Germany, we have strong institutions, like the constitutional court, and perhaps they have the, they have the legitimacy to push things forward, like the Canadian Supreme Court or like, and it's very interesting because administrative courts in Germany said no, well, there is no uh, valid claim for uh, uh, amending um, climate justice laws. And then the constitutional court stepped in mm -hmm. and developed something. That will be my, my idea. Thank you very much. This is a very tricky question, <laughs> which raises many, many, many aspects. Uh, for instance, the issue of prioritization. Uh, you say, well, climate change is the most important thing, but maybe not. Maybe for some people it is one important thing, but there are other also important things that might be reconciled, and this is the duty of the government to reconcile competing interests. Uh, for instance, if I was a judge adjudicating those claims, I would be very puzzled because, for instance, the cons Spanish Constitution provides different mandates to the government. So the Constitution says you must protect the environment. This is clear. But it says also you must promote economic development. You must fight uh, unemployment in a country with three million people unemployed, at least official figures. You need to reduce the imbalance between the different regions in terms of economic development. So uh, all these rules, from a formal point of view, have the le same legal nature, the same legal force. This is one problem, prioritization. Eh? But if you prioritize climate change, we have the problem that uh, maybe we are not happy with the existing legal rules, but lawyers cannot invent the legal rules. They can interpret. Eh? So I would say that the only solution is to engage for the promotion and the for, for the creation of the legal rules, how? Well, trying to influence with our work, with our teaching, with our uh, write, uh, writings to uh, influencing the legislators, influencing the political parties. They are those who rule the countries, political parties. Vote for political parties who prioritize uh, climate change. So as citizens, we can do many things. Uh, but uh, I think that we, we need to wait for some years to develop those rules because at least in my view now, apart from those rules have, that, that have been 
uh, approved, we don't have those rules that you demand. Yeah? Yes. I'm just asking a question. <laughs> yes, yeah. yes. Um, uh, Pascal. Thank you very much. I, I think this discussion is fascinating because, as Aneta said, it reconciles both the uh, Oli Lando lecture about the role of the judge and, and, and the, we are really in the core of the methodological perspective. Uh, at the same time, I, I want to come back to uh, Professor Morena Molino's point regarding Greenpeace versus Spain and make a parallel, not with the Swiss case, despite the fact that I'm Swiss, but with the Council of State in France in June 21. Because there, uh, the highest administrative court of a country said to the government, you know, it's not enough what you have in your proposal to, to meet the Paris Agreement. And of course, the Paris ag uh, Agreement is a commitment taken by the government. Mm -hmm. So you have to stand behind your commitment. And we, as highest court in the country, I mean, administrative court in the country, we ask you to do more. So they did not just say, what you have decided is not valid. You have to do that, but you have to do something more. So it seems to me that at least in some countries, but probably in others, you have other ways to get to the same result. There are ways to do so. And, and the fact to say uh, that uh, one has to balance between different fundamental rights, it seems to me, but I'm not a, a constitutional judge, that this is what all constitutional judges do all the time, balancing. It doesn't mean that it's always climate interest that would prevail, uh, but, and you can't, I mean, you cannot say that uh, procedural rules will trump all the requirements. At some point, you need to find ways, so to say, and that's also uh, of the responsibility of judges to find these ways, I, I think. And they cannot just sit and say, okay, let's wait uh, three more years to, to find a, a, a constitutional basis. So I would like to see how you react to this, uh, because you know that the decision of June 21, how would that fit into your, um, you know, understanding of this situation? Oh, thank uh, you. I'm oh, sorry. Uh, now, please, please answer, and then we will still give voice to to Henrik, mm. who is uh, somehow handicapped. Uh. Yeah. <laughs> sorry, please. <laughs> and then. Well, thank you very much. This Conseil d'État ruling was a revolutionary ruling, so Conseil d'État could have said the different thing that I cannot order the government to impose a specific reduction. I'm very happy about that, but it was, just, uh, it was uh, probably an exception. Eh? It's, uh, and uh, it was un for me, it was unexpected. Eh? But if you still keep in the same system of administrative justice, you have the Climat Zacht case in Belgium, where the Council of State say, I cannot you order to do anything, but uh, uh, because of my, uh, I cannot order you something precise to do. You have to do something, but cannot tell you exactly. So the judge at the end of the day is not framing the policy, but it's requiring the government to frame it. Eh? So we can find in the same system of, of administrative justice different, different replies. Eh? Another question, which is very interesting, we don't have the time to address it, is uh, sometimes the, uh, uh, the plaintiffs sue the government because they don't do something that they are required. In some jurisdictional systems, uh, it is difficult to sue the government for inaction. You can sue the government for action because you claim it's illegal. But if there is no action, there is no control because there is, no, no, the, there is nothing to control. This is something happening also in some countries such as Spain, for instance, this administrative inactivity is difficult to challenge because there is not a previous act or a previous regulation. This is something that must be corrected by the legislator. Uh, uh, when, so it is easy for the legislator to amend the procedural law and saying, well, even in case of inactivity, NGOs will be allowed to sue. Yes, it, but these rules, then, these rules does not exist yet. So it, it could come in the future if people are involved and politicians are sensitive about those issues. But in some countries, it is still the case. Thank you. Uh, Henrik, please. All right, um, thank you. Uh, uh, but it, just 
really want to say is, um, and I will probably re, uh, repeat myself from what I said at the conference in, in Ferrara a couple of, of months ago. Um, if we were to meet in 100 years time, we would not have this conversation because at that time we have the regulation in, in place. It's not there now. Uh, what our project is doing is to provide the landscape of what is the law we have and how is it possible uh, for for the courts, or at least to consider, can we apply this as relevant context uh, for the case that, that we have uh, uh, before us? Um, having said that, um, and as much as, as I appreciate, of course, that courts are not uh, legislators, but given uh, the gravity of, of the climate situation, it is necessary that we act right now. And unfortunately, I must say that lawmakers are not always the fastest to, to respond to urgent uh, situations. And that's where the courts, they come in. They can fill in the holes within the rule of law um, by connecting these different legal areas and use them as context to, to move the law in a direction that is still within the legal framework. And then it's a question of how progressive can a system be? It's very different from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. Uh, for example, if you take uh, the Danish courts, they uh, take a very conservative approach. Uh, whereas we've seen in, uh, in the Netherlands, the courts there, they are much more progressive. So it's also, of course, a matter of how progressive are the, the courts. Um, and that's where we are not there to, to force the courts to, to do anything that is beyond what they find is within their, uh, their sphere of, of law and their particular uh, methodology. So, yeah, that's just what I wanted to say. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. We have a question here, here, and one more. And we will have to close. Uh, and m my kind request to you, please be concise. <laughs> OK. Thanks a lot. Um, what I meant as well is that there are some, some cases that can be called or considered climate cases that are really based on more specific legal grounds than I agree with you. Sometimes it's creative legal thinking and sometimes you have more specific legal grounds. For example, we are challenging the Delegated Act that has been adopted by the European Commission under the taxonomy framework to qualify gas as sustainable and we have specific legal grounds for that. And that can be considered as a climate case as well. So there are many other cases uh, that, that are based on legal grounds. Another point, we shouldn't only be talking about climate. That's a mistake that we often do. We should be about climate, the climate and the biodiversity crisis because they are both intertwined and interdependent. Uh, another point that I wanted to make is that um, judges need to live with their time as well. We live in an exceptional uh, period and the urgency uh, that we are facing to tackle the climate and the biodiversity crisis call for exceptional rulings like the Conseil d'État ruling. And so it's true that it depends on the judges and how ambitious they will be with the way they can interpret the law. And I think the law, just like the Plumman test, that is only a purely question of interpretation of the law, should change because there's just no reason why the law should continue being adopted, uh, interpreted like that. And about that, I'm surprised because the, the way to challenge decisions from European institutions, uh, from the questions that has been asked previously, is also uh, under the Iris regulation that after our case in which the EU has been found in violation of the Iris Convention, uh, after our case before the Irish Convention Compliance Committee in breach of the Irish Convention not to give legal standing before the Court of Justice of the EU, that case led to the revision of the Irish regulation. And now NGOs and individuals to a certain extent can challenge more acts and omissions uh, by European institutions, agencies and bodies and that's how we are challenging delegated acts adopted by European Commission and for us that's really the main way uh, to challenge acts of European institutions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, please. Yeah.
Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, it, it was very useful that uh, Anna spoke uh, uh, before me uh, because I, I fully agree and I, I thank all, all the interveners. Um, I was a judge uh, my, myself and uh, in this capacity I must say I fully disagree with Professor Morena Molino about the role of, of uh, judges. Uh, um, I, I don't want to offend you, uh, uh, we are at your university here, but uh, um, maybe the, the, um, for sure uh, the thinking of judges changed a lot, uh, including uh, of judges from, from the uh, European Court of Justice. So um, this is uh, one one point, and in the in the uh, national uh, uh, environment, uh, judicial environment, procedural, uh, Spain, as uh, Romania, where I came from, and other uh, countries from the Roman law inspiration, you know that uh, there there is. A <laughs> Uh, command for for judges uh, the denial of justice so I if uh, uh, as a judge you you receive a, a complaint you must judge you you cannot just sit and said oh this is not for me this is for the uh, parliament or for the region to uh, to some, so th from this point of view uh, I I fully agree and uh, last um, Unlike, uh, if I understand your point, uh, in the, uh, the Spanish constitution, uh, for instance, the Romanian constitution has an article under the category uh, human rights, uh, the uh, right to a, a healthy environment. What is in the practice, how some courts put this in practice, this is another, this is another question for uh, for another conference, but uh, uh, only uh, as a matter of fact, some constitution do uh, place this as a human rights for individuals. Thank you. Yeah, and the last question, because we are exceeding our time already. Although I have so many more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> some my my yeah, question goes to a point that has been uh, that. Uh, Professor Murina Moreno, um, sorry for mispronouncing your name, uh, touched upon and that also Henrik briefly indicated. Uh, we are all talking about climate litigation that takes place in a number of, in a limited number of countries, mostly in the Western area. Um, but the, the climate changes do affect us all, even if the climate, the emission comes from, come from other countries, China mostly, um, or also other countries in the rest of the world. So isn't a very important question also how that will play out internationally, WTO litigation is probably not the right word, but dispute resolution. So shouldn't we also pay an attention on how anything that will be decided here, um, and I think that that is climate litigation here is a very important first step, can be transferred across borders to the rest of the world and what will be acceptable there because it is quite unlikely that any climate litigation will be brought in a Chinese court anytime soon. So how does that play into the question how we act here in the West at all? I'm very short. I'm I've been following this discussion. Um, it's amazing and it's fantastic. Um, I, we are all very much aware of the problem. We want the judges to do a lot. We want the legislators to do more international, the World Trade Organization and so forth. But on the name of climate justice, we cannot change our main uh, foundations of the rule of law, which is the division of powers. And that if we destroy the division of powers and we go and move towards a judicial activism, then we are destroying the legitimacy of democracy. So sorry, but the activism has to be focused primarily, primarily upon the legislator. And this is uh, the, our rules. We have given our rules of democracy. So uh, even if we will like 
we would like to, judges to do more. We cannot blame them to do more because they are complying with the rules of law. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much. And now, impossible mission for the panelists to give uh, uh, one minute uh, <laughs> overall assessment and answer. Uh, starting with uh, Henrik. Right. Thank you. Um, and I, I will be, be brief. Um, um, and I will address um, the issue about what are they doing in, in other parts of um, uh, of the world. Can we expect that a Chinese court, for example, will uh, will uh, um, uphold uh, the protection of uh, of the climate? Um, now, we I think first of all, well, we have to take this European basis uh, for it and um, and and force the other states, uh, the, the EU is doing that already when it comes to, to China and the, the anti-dumping uh, rules. And China has in its Belt and Road Initiative already um, uh, implemented policies about environment. Um, so I think from an EU side, there are these expectations that China is actually doing something uh, when it comes to the environment and protection of, of the climate. Mm. Um, it might not be enough, but it is rolling uh, in in that uh, in that direction. So I think the EU, by um, keeping a very firm um, approach to other states uh, and some of the initiatives that are taken to prohibit certain types of products from entering into the EU uh, if they're not climate friendly, for example, um, that that can work and that will also be um, uh, or I will assume will be uh, respected in the World Trade Organization, should there be uh, any cases there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very short. I mean, we have to interpret as judges the existing law, and again, a little Latin, mutatis mutandis. <laughs> yeah, and, and, but the, the devil rests in the detail. The, the, of <laughs> course. So we will uh, not lose our jobs as lawyers and judges and uh, <laughs> legal community. Yes, well, as a summary, I would say that uh, we, 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 we would like to, to live in a better world, but we live in, a, in, a, in our current world. We've given rules we cannot manipulate beyond reasonability, or reasonable as the, uh, the legal rules. Uh, I think that in the Western world, if we understand by the Western world this part of Europe, we should be satisfied with, with what the governments are doing. I mean, most governments are approving comprehensive plans uh, affecting a number of economic sectors, transportation, agriculture, housing. In mm. Spain has prohibited the extraction of oil, the extraction of uranium, the extraction of a strange uh, land, which has, I don't know the uh, uh, geological name of this, this land, this, this uh, dust that needs needed to, uh, to, 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 to manufacture uh, batteries. Uh, there are lots of limitations. Uh, judges are, uh, are issuing creative rulings in many jurisdictions. Uh, there is a real progress. So we, uh, we, we should expect progress from the countries which are really the contributors and those who are really to blame for climate change, especially China. Uh, I will not say anything apart from thank you for <laughs> taking part. It was excellent. There were we had excellent presentation, incredibly interesting discussion, and uh, in uh, six minutes we are going to uh, jump on the exercise uh, panel, and we will continue uh, discussion uh, in a, in the subject area. Uh, sustainable uh, life uh, for Ally. So thank you very much. Thank you very, very much.